Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is the Stephen Allen and welcome back to another Top 10 video. As you can see today, I'll be doing my personal Top 10 favourite villains from the Batman 66 TV show. Now, before we go into, into this, I just want to say I absolutely love this show. I've said it um, probably a million times already and one of the things I always loved about the show was the villains. Now, some were... Now, believe it or not, very few villains actually from the show were actually adapted from the comics. Majority of the villains were actually created specifically for the show. And another thing that made this these villains so great is that they were played by huge actors and stars of the day. And that just and when you're a villain on this show, it just shows that just how big you were during this time period. And it's also just like it just shows just how much of an impact this show has and just how beloved it is. Now, before we get into the top 10, let's get into the honorable mentions. Now, these honorable mentions are villains that I really liked but couldn't fit in my top 10, but I needed to give them a shout out. So, these are my five. Ranking in order of my 15 favorite villains, uh, you know, because they could make top 10. These are basically would be in my top 15 um number 15 is louis the lilac number 14 is ma parker number 13 is zelda the great number 12 is the minstrel and number 11 would be false face now i absolutely love these villains i find them they're all great and they were created specifically for the show. And they're all unique in their own right. The with the Lilac is basically a gangster with an obsession with flowers, particularly lilacs, hence his nickname. Ma Parker is essentially the like a th like a throwback to those like depression era outlaws. In fact, she's based off the real life well, the myth of the infamous Ma Barker. Zelda the Great is basically a magician who's forced into a life of crime. Now, Anne Baxter would, ironically, years later, or actually two years later in the series, would come back to play a different villain, Olga, who I really liked, but for me, just, she was great as Zelda, and I wish they could have brought that character back instead of her to play a new one. But, you know, I, I, I like I like her. She's absolutely great. Anne Baxter was a great actress. And then, of course, there is the Minstrel, a character created specifically for the show. Um, they only had... Yeah, he he is like pretty much a musician who who is gifted in technology, particularly sound waves. So and that I find that meshes well together with music and you know and sound waves. Created specifically for the show and was sent to be like the bat like a new villain for Batman to face, particularly like with sound like with um like technology. I found that to be an interesting idea. And False Face, believe it or not, was actually a character from the comics. I always thought he was created specifically for the show. And basically, he's a master of disguise. All these guys are great. So I just want to give him a shout out, an honorable mention. And with that out of the way, let's actually get on with the list. Okay, I'm going to get flack. Number 10 is the Joker, portrayed by Cesar Romero. Okay, a lot of flack coming. The Joker is up there as the top four core anchor villains of the series, and I will admit, I have huge respect for Cesar Romero, she, he, he was the first Joker, and I will admit, he does breathe life into the role, and he does a comic accurate interpretation of what the Joker was at this time, see around the time the show aired, the Joker was more of a pranks the character than the homicidal maniac that he's more known for today or even more darker he's more this joker's more light-hearted and i gotta admit i do like how joker just does whatever he wants you know in the show like whatever all these crap capers the, they the big or they're just small time the crazier for, for him the crazier the capers the more he's going to be invested in it so i will admit these romero just does the role really well but if I could be honest, he's not my per he's he's not my favorite interpretation of the Joker. But you know, he is the first. He did the role what it was at the time, and you can really tell the Caesar Romero is having a blast playing this role. And I cannot give him fault for that. 
interesting fact uh, in close up, especially with the Blu ray, you can actually see that he has this mustache. That's because Caesar Romero will not shave it, was his trademark, and said just had makeup powder over his face to cover it up. Like I said, not I prefer the more comic accurate Joker, but I could always love this inter but I could always love Caesar Romero's interpretation and respect for being the first Joker. So yeah. That's why it's at number ten. I just find the more villains either more entertaining or more fully fledged out. That's why they are at that's why they are further up. And yeah, I just couldn't really put the Joker in the top four position, you know, the top four, like he always is. I have to be honest, and I just find these villains either far, far more entertaining and far more enjoyable. And yeah, so number 10, nothing against the late Cesar Romero, but honestly, I just like these more, so please don't hate me for that. Number 9, Shame, portrayed by Cliff Robertson. Interesting fact, Cliff Robertson would actually would go to appear in Another would actually appear in a Mar in Marvel movies, particularly in the Spider Man's the Sam Raimi Spider Man series as Uncle Ben. So that's a bit of a fun fact there. Basically, Shame is a super well, basically a super villain who is a send up to those like Western movie characters or e even TV show cowboys of the fifties and sixties. And his name is a reference to the night to the night. Uh, the a 1950s western movie called Shame. He has appeared in season two, and like Joker appeared in all three seasons. This guy appeared in season two, and <clears throat> again, his crimes revolve around what you would expect from a western outlaw, you know, of the old west. And he was, and honestly, when he first appeared, I wanted, I honestly thought he was just going to be a one-shot villain. And I found him entertaining. Granted, his story might be a bit weak in some places, but I found his episode, his two-parter in season two, to be very entertainable. But I never thought he would return. And to my surprise, season three he returned. And season three was one of the few exceptions where it really pat that Shane really went through a character development. And honestly, season three for me is perhaps I think the many reasons why people love this character so much. I love Cliff Robertson just plays him as a dumb cowboy. You know, as a dumb cowboy, he is he is ruthless. He talks the part. And I just like how you really feel that all the villains, in my opinion, all the villains on the list, this guy's a real threat. He would fit perfectly in a modern Batman comic. He'd be dumb, but he's also ruthless, quick on the draw. And like I said, season, yeah, season three was, all, like I said, was really the best interpretation for Shame. Here he got more character fleshed out. His gang was really west, like of the western characters, like uh, Chief Stand and Pat and Fred. You know, he played off well with those two characters as members of his gang in season three, and his mother and and the mother-in-law, uh, Frontier Fanny, as he was with his and his fiance Calamity Jan. Clearly a reference to Calamity Jane, played by his by his real life wife at the time. Overall, Shane was just a really, really great and interesting character, and he was just really fun to play, uh, you know, fun to watch, and from interviews, Cliff Robertson said he had a blast doing this, and I was shocked, like I said, I'm shocked that he came back for season 3, I thought it'd be a one shot, that'd be it, he came back, and I love that he did, and for me, his two-parter in season 3 is one of the classic, exa is was some of the best episodes of season 3. In my opinion, and I loved every minute he was on screen. Number eight, the bookworm, portrayed by Roger McDowell. This is a villain who should have come back. He shouldn't have had a two-parter. He should have come back as a minor reoccurring villain. The bookworm, played by Roger Roger McDowell, who of course is known for Planet of the Apes, but he also voiced the Mad Hatter in the Batman the Animated Series. Um, basically, the bookworm is a criminal obsessed with books and literature. His background is that he used to be a author, but none of his books could get published because he's, um, when he tried to write his own novels, he kept copying plots of others. There was no originality. This drove him insane. I like the, the look of the character, and I like how his episode, like, his episode, I just found to be really funny, especially with his henchmen. 
I also gotta admit, I like how he had these violent mood swings. I really, again, season one, for me, is perhaps the best season of the show. Season two went far too overboard, but was still entertainable, even though it's a, it came a bit of a drag. Season three... I actually like it. It's flawed in some places, but I found it to be a pretty okay season. It's not terrible. Anyway, this guy should have definitely returned. And basically, he commits his crimes based on books, such as references to plots. And I like how he can read at super fast lightning speed to hilarity. And he does these quotes from books. The, the, the costume and that torch on his hat. You know, I, it's just great. And Roger McDowell, I heard he loved the part. And he wanted to come back, and the creators did, but I never knew why he didn't come back. And as far as what I've been told, the bookworm was a very, it was received very well. And I like how when he's around, Batman and Robin have to use all their literary knowledge to really track, you know, not to track bookworm down to stop his plots. He should have come back, he should have come back, and yeah. And for many, he's a fan favorite, really. And I think he's definitely made his transition into the comics. And I think. I don't know if he has. But if he did, he should definitely be a member of the Nightwing Rogues Gallery. You know, he could be, you know, the bookworm could be like Nightwing's Riddler. You know, sort of. But instead of book, instead of riddles, he does books. He And his look definitely echoes the more modern Riddler. When you actually look at it with the glasses, the suit. And the suit is said to be made out of book bindings. Which again, it reinforces the bookworm's love of books. And he's a really great character. Absolutely love him. Now, coming in at number 7. Mr. Freeze. Now, Mr. Freeze is one of the few actors on the show to be portrayed by three actors. The third one was portrayed by Eli Wallach. And honestly, I knew I had to have Mr. Freeze on the list because I really liked his character. My problem, I didn't know which version. Should I have done... The first version, portrayed by George Sanders, the first incarnation, and appeared only in season one. And here, George, and here, George Sanders, when we're introduced to his freeze, first off, he looks different, more like an astronaut in a way. And here, we're introduced that he used to be a criminal scientist, who was after an encounter with Batman, had his um, had you know mutated to his you know, biology to the point where he can only survive in sub zero temperatures in a cold suit. And his episode I really found to be a real highlight. And basically he commits his crimes to get enough funds to keep in a cool environment, but also get revenge on Batman because he blames him for the state that he's forced to live in. Again, really great character. And I like how he is human. Granted he's a criminal he, you know, he he's a criminal. He does do crimes. But in a way, like, there's this scene at the end of part two where he has this, like, com like dinner conversation with Batman, and he does admire them. And, again, I'll, this when he says this line, how he can never be out in the sun again, he has to be in cold, this cold environment alone. He doesn't believe that prison will help him, you know, cure him of his condition. Yeah, and I like how Batman takes responsibility and has some guilt for what he caused overall i like how he's just human he's human he's the more human of the freezers now the second one Otto preminger who was a famous hollywood director of what i've been told and was cast as the new mr freeze when george sanders was unavailable now i've got to give credit for Otto preminger to have the look of freeze this look is what come what you expect to freeze. He's what the how he says wild a lot is his catchphrase. The orange eyebrows I find to be a like a really surprising contrast. And his plot in that in interpretation is to get revenge on Batman by humiliating him, ruining his reputation, and he plans to also find love by forcing this woman to love him. Again, I like how that's, I like the, that plot, because he wants to finally have someone in the world with him. But unlike Sanders, this guy has little humanity at all. He has very little empathy or care for others. Even when he's ransoming the city for $1 billion or recovering the city in, you know, ice. He does not back down. He does not show empathy when they say they can't raise that much money. Yeah, that is a good interpretation, and it's a more modern and more criminal Mr. Freeze. And to many people, Otto Preminger is the better of the Freezes. Eli Welch just portrayed Freeze as a, um, this criminal psycho. Well, you know, comic book character. But 
but I actually can because these two are just perfect. So I decided to have them both on the list as a tie, as I can't put one over the other. They're just both great freezers in their own right, and they just do the role differently. Now, now in order for Imager, was appeared in free as Mr. Freeze in season two. You know, like Wallach did in the two in the final two episodes of season two, but Freeze never returned for season three, probably because they couldn't get one actor to continually stay on the role. Plus, with the budget cuts of season three, I highly doubt Mr. Freeze would have actually appeared. Overall, I like these two interpretations and decided to give them both the spot because they both do something different with the character, but at the same time, just introduce new things to the, char the character. Also, uh, interesting fact here, the reason why they were recast was different. Uh, like I said, George Sanders, he was unavailable, but got Otto Preminger, and he was well-received. But everyone hated working with him on set. So they wanted to bring Mr. Freeze back. There was no way they were going to rehire him. George Sander was still unavailable. And they got Eli Wallach. So that's why that happened. Also, when this character appeared on TV, they renamed the character Mr. Freeze. In the comics, it was Mr. Zero. So that's a bit of fun fact there. Anyway, um, that's number seven. Coming in at number number six. The Mad Hatter, portrayed by David Wayne. Now, heads up. This version of the character, as we all know, was based on the imposter Mad Hatter, you know, the, 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 the one that's obsessed with hats. It's a, he has a more convol complicated history. If you want to know all about the history of the Mad Hatter, you know, Batman's Mad Hatter, then you should check out this video where, a YouTube, where two YouTubers, um, Mr. Rogues and JJ Hatter, did a collaboration explaining the history of Jervis Tetch, Batman's Mad Hatter. Really check that out to understand this whole thing. You know, the whole thing, but, yeah. But it wasn't revealed that this was an imposter at the time, and as a result, this Mad Hatter was treated as an actual villain. Now, and, yeah. So here, Jervis Tetch, he's one of the few villains on the show to actually have a real name. That was the same for Mr. Freeze in season one, when it was called Dr. Shivel, but we'll get back to that later. Basically, in the show's run, the Mad Hatter is basically a villain who's obsessed with stealing hats, particular, and also to own Batman's cow. In his season one opening, he is basically on a revenge plot, kidnapping the members of the jury that convicted him, and also plan to do away, do away with Batman as he blames him for, you know, sending him to prison. And, and honestly, season one was a really good episode for him. He came back for season two for the last time. He only had he only appeared in two se the first two seasons, each with one two-parter episode. And he and season and he's one of the few villains on the show to actually succeed in his plot. And that is, he finally gets Batman's cow. Oh, uh, well, there's a bit of a spoiler there. Um, and the Mad Hatter here, he looks exactly like from the comics. And the, he has the super instant mesmerizer in his top hat. I think it was a precursor to the whole mind control gimmick. That wouldn't be till years later. I like how the Mad Hatter, his motivation is hats and greed. And he's easy to write. David Wayne just does it, just does the role magnificent he looks like the character just jumped out from off the comics the the, the, the suit and even like the, the accent i find really great and i just like how in his first his first episode the villains say he's off his rocker like he's a bit bonkers something i found surprising that no one ever said that about joker but they say about the mad hatter i always i absolutely love the guy and i wish he returned for season three he couldn't come back and his motivation would have been to get batgirl's cow he finds that cow to be good, and he needs to add it to his collection. Again, something could easily work with the Mad Hatter. Uh, also, I've got to admit, his fight, his like bat fights, like at the end of the two-parter, in each in each of his two parts, I found to be the best choreographed fights. And I just like just how the character looks, his mannerisms, his accents, and just how off the rails he is. And yeah, again, this is based on the imposter version, but the and despite knowing that, I gotta admit, I like how he's treated as a genuine villain, as a genuine villain, and not knowing he's an imposter, just, you know, just, just, just treat him like a actual character, and not knowing that he's gonna be the fake version, again, that didn't come until the 80s, but still, an absolutely great villain, excellently written, and looks exactly like the comic book version, and you're also surprised he looks like some of the more normal villains on the list, speaking of, uh, normal, Coming in at number five, well, speaking of not normal, coming in at number five,
Egghead. Egghead, betrayed by Vincent Price. That's all you bloody well need to know. Egghead is basically a criminal mastermind who's obsessed with eggs, has an egg theme, and is basic and it stands for two things: his love of eggs and that he's an egghead, as one of the smartest criminals around. He appeared in season two in a two-parter, and basic and returned for season three. He's he's up there as like one of the most. He's up there in the what we call the top six villains of the show. Basically, you know the six of the best villains ever to appear. You know, to be reoccurring. Now, Vincent Price just does the role well. Vincent Price, of course, known for horror, but I like how he just went went loose with the crazy and zaniness. The egg-related puns, the look of the character with that, you know, yellow and white suit, that the bald head, and Vincent Price just, his delivery of the lines. And he was so great in season two with his debut two-parter. He was brought back for season three where he teamed up with Olga for three episodes and a cameo. Egghead is just one of those villains that's created specifically for you know, created specifically for the show and his crumbs are revolved around eggs. But it's not just that, but he also just commits high stakes crime because he is considered himself the smartest criminal ever. And yeah, that's what I like about him. He has this reputation. And he's just, and he's definitely smart, as he's one of the two villains on the show to actually, fi- well, come at least figure out Batman's identity. Of course, he realizes he's mistaken, but how he figures it out is pretty smart, based on pure deduction alone. Yeah, and plus, you got Vincent Price playing him. Like I said, enough said, enough said, and the style is pretty great. And as far as I know, he's been adapted into the comics, granted a minor character, but he could easily be, you know, reinterpreted as something far more darker and sinister. I would really like that. And speaking of characters that have definitely been adapted to comics and have appeared on the show, let's give our hand to our number four. King Tuck, portrayed by Victor Warner, one of the only villains created specifically for the show to appear in all three seasons. And also one of the few villains, just like Jervis Tetch, the Mad Hatter, to actually have a real name and a criminal name. Well, Professor William R. McElroy was a professor at Egyptology at Yale University, but he suffers from a split personality. Every time he gets hit on the head, he thinks he's the reincarnation of King Tut, and does his crimes around Egyptian, around Egyptology, in order to take over Gotham City as he believes it's to be, you know, his, right, his rightful place. Now, one like all the villains either play it straight or can be sometimes, you know, play it straight, this is one of the few villains that goes full over the top silly. Basically, King Tut is a man-child. And I like how also at the end of his episodes, except for one, he gets hit on the head, he reverts back to normal. Victor Bruno just inhabits the role. Now, I will admit, in his first episode, his first debut, he's still, he's a little bit crazy, but I don't feel he was fully comfortable yet. Come season two, he became more comfortable. Then by season three, his episodes were, in my opinion, the best of that season. And I just love how Victor Bruno just fully encabulates the role. You know, he just he just really steals the scenes. He makes you laugh, and of course, it's 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 just fantastic writing there. How he delivers his lines. He could. He can just nail, not just nail his line, but something silly, like, he just makes you, he just makes you laugh, he is that funny, and he's clearly, by season 3, I think he clearly went fully off the rails a bit, you know, in character wise, but that made sense, after that long, why wouldn't a character have not fully gone off the rails? Victor Bruno just absolutely embodies this performance, embodies this role, and no one could have done the role better. And for me, out of all the villains to be created specifically for the show, he's definitely the best. Coming in at number three. The Penguin, portrayed by Burgess Meredith. This is based off the classic version. Now, I'm more of the modern version of the Penguin, and the Penguin is my favourite Batman villain. So, if you're thinking that, why is he at number three? Well, it's just I just like two more villains better, and I find them to be the superior villains to being created for the show. I'm not saying that Burgess Meredith did not do, you know, he 
that he was not. That he's terrible. And he is absolutely fantastic. Why wouldn't he be? At, otherwise, he wouldn't be at number three. He appeared in all three seasons. He was always fun to be around. And basically, this is based off the um, gentleman thief who who plans and commits high stakes crime. And we know that he's done it. Well, the authorities know he's done it, but they can't prove it. And here, Burgess Meredith introduced several traits of the penguin that are known today. The waddling, the quack laugh, and that's based on the fact, because around this time, Burgess Meredith, he couldn't, he, he can't smoke properly. You know, he because he quit smoking, and he was reforced to smoke for the role. And every time he did his laugh, it would be in his throat, the smoke, and he made this quack noise. And as a result, that trait of the penguin has been born from this ever since. I really just like how Burgess Meredith just really, na not just nails, but really just embodies the classic Penguin to a T. He looks like, and in his first debut, unlike other villains, I think, or at least some of the main, they were slowly evolve into the role. He was immediately there from the get-go, and he is absolutely fantastic. And believe it or not, like I said, some of his performances, mannerisms have infl infl influenced the character in the comic sense. But also, some of the stuff he did on the show have been evolved from this show since, such as his episode where he ran for mayor, which has been used in Batman Returns as a plotline, but at the same time, also for Gotham, where Penguin did become mayor and ran the city for a while. Overall, this is just a fantastic portrayal of the character, hands down. But we're not quite there yet. Coming in at number two. Catwoman, portrayed by Julie Newmar. A Catwoman was portrayed by three actors throughout the whole series. Technically, Julie Newmar was in the first two seasons, Eartha Kitt did season three, and Lee Merriweather in the movie, with, when he was with Joker, Penguin, and another villain. But for me, this is hands down one of the greatest characters to appear on the show. And I like how the character evolved as the series went along in her debut in her actual proper debut, she was portrayed as simply as a cat burglar thief who wants to quickly get, you know, who basically just wants to get rich. She's basically a cat burglar with her, you know, cat theme literally stretched. But at the same time, she just hates Batman for walking her away, basically on pure revenge. She has a cat and mouse. She has, and overall the look is just absolutely spectacular and has really influenced the look on the character, you know, since but as the series went along especially season two she developed feelings and there was this chemistry building between yeah batman and batman and her especially in her return also gotta admit in her debut i liked how her part ended unlike few villains she didn't she didn't get arrested she re fell presumably to her death but of course season three it's revealed that she didn't Overall, I absolutely like Julie Newmar portraying the role and how the character slowly evolved and had chemistry between Batman. But there's something about Life of Crumb that just kept pulling her back. Like, she just, she wants to be with Batman, she loves him, but at the same time, she wouldn't hesitate to kill him. There's a bit of, you know, jumping back and forth here. And Julie Newmar, of course, just looks stunning. That's the word I'm going to use, stunning. That describes not just her physique, but just like her mannerisms, her just character, she is absolutely just awesome in the role. And of course, other interpretations did something different. Oh, you know, from like the Burns and whatever, portrays her more as a femme fatale, more villainous than Julie Newmar was more you know, complex. And Eartha Kitt just portrayed her as this more wild tiger, you know, with little empathy. Um, almost to a point of... Hmm. Overall, Catwoman, Jolene Noir, best version, number two. And she was this close to getting number one spot. So number one is given to, ladies and gentlemen, drum roll please. The Riddler, portrayed by Frank Gorshin. For many people, this show did a lot for the Riddler in the comics than any other villain for the show. Not only was his first debut, but it catapulted Riddler from a, you see, at the time when Riddler first debuted, he hadn't appeared very much in the comics and was going, and was almost going to become a forgotten villain. But the show catapulted him to becoming an A-lister ever since. Now, Frank Gorshin absolutely, for me, is the, is one of the greatest versions of the Riddler. 
Is he a comic modern accurate? Probably yes and no. You see, Frank Gorshin was a stand-up comedian and an impressionist. And for season one, he had eight episode appearances and was the most popular villain on the show for its first season. Here, he is a complete cackling looney tune, the laugh and just the energy of jumping around. One minute, and then he can then he switches to this more serious, almost a split person, almost a split personality, and became scary. And of course, appeared in the movie. And from and plus, the show revolves so well around how the formula for the series works. Riddler appears, leaves a clue, the police call him Batman, tracks down who not. And also, the riddles are some of the most entertaining things to watch on the show. And Frank Gorshin, for many, is the Riddler. But, he's not a comic accurate. But, for the show, he is definitely hands down the best villain that the show has ever given. But there's a catch. After season one with and movie with becoming the most popular villain on the show, Frank Gorshin felt he deserved more money. But the studio didn't. And as a result, for season two, Frank Gorshin never appeared. And as a result, we were given compromises, such as a knockoff villain called The Puzzler. Not even that great, to be honest. And, of course, John Aston, known for playing Gomez Adams on The Adams Family, stepped into the role of the Riddler, who I felt he did a remarkable job, but he just wasn't Frank Gorshin. And as a result, season three, Frank Gorshin made his return for one episode. Now, unlike the other villain, well, Mania 4, he had the least episode appearances, at least of the character. But I really feel that the Riddler is the best ver is the best villain on the show, because a Frank Gorshin, unlike the others, I feel just really, yeah, no, just embodied the role and just went on the rails. Season eight for me was definitely the best season, and mostly because of the Riddler. Riddler Frank Gorshin just absolutely captivates the scene, and I just love that wild laugh, that Looney Tune. The costume, he really looks like the Riddler, from his normal suit to that, like, what I guess you could call onesie. No one, for me, will ever come close to really nailing the Riddler. And for many people, Frank Gorshin is considered the best live-action version, and do I agree? Yes. Don't get me wrong, I love Corey Smith's version of the Riddler. Uh, but I don't think as anyone has even come close to even topping Frank Gorshin, at least in live action. Animation? Well, there's definitely been John Glover. Is it John? Wait. Uh, as, wait, sorry. I forgot the actor's name, but there's the actor who did him, or well, voice actor who did him in Batman the Animated Series. Definitely the best modern version up there with, of course, the guy that voiced him in the Arkham games. All great, but that's voice work. Can we really say that they are? Uh, but who's the best live action? Look at Frank. He, the late Frank Gorshin absolutely just did this role well. I really wish we could have had more episodes with him, but sadly we did not. He is hands down the best villain on the show and forever be Batman 66 greatest number one villain. Now, do you guys agree with me on this? Which one is your favorite? Do you think that Ritter should have been number one? Or do you think, how would you rearrange this list? Let me know in the comments, and this is the Steven Hour, and until the next video, good, enjoy the rest of your day, and so long for now.